What was the worst year of TV? Some may point to 2019 for how badly they butchered the final season of Game of Thrones or even 2009 just because of this Breaking Bad scene alone. Happy birthday. But every year has terrible shows and moments in those shows, especially the shows that no one even watched. So instead, we wanted to take a step back and look at the years that had an overall lackluster lineup or years that really hurt the TV medium as a whole. We found five years that deserve a mention. We're talking about years affected by global events or shifts in the industry, or years where TV lost to another form of media or pushed a genre into the mainstream from which we're still suffering to this day. It's important to note that we're focusing on more recent years because, let's face it, once you go too far back, a lot of shows were just copies of one another. So let's kick off the list by tackling the obvious one, and that's 2021. In 2020, we were blindsided by the COVID-19 pandemic that would last the next three years. Every industry worldwide felt the impact, especially film and TV. Loads of movies and TV shows were delayed and had their production suspended or postponed. However, the pandemic's effect on TV was much worse than its effect on film. Initially, when digging into this topic for a video, I anticipated slotting in 2020, much like the worst years in film video. But surprisingly, 2020 turned out to be an awesome year for TV. With more people staying at home, TV viewership shot up. Though live sports were put on hold, many had their eyes glued to the news. Plus, we were in the peak of the streaming wars, with each streaming service churning out fantastic original content at reasonable monthly rates without restricting password sharing. Let's do a little comparison between the shows that aired in 2020 and 2021. For new shows, 2021 actually did a bit better, with gems like Arcane, Squid Game, Invincible, and Reservation Dogs. But it played a big part in the current rut that the MCU finds itself in by jamming too many MCU shows into that year. That's not to say 2020 didn't have any great new shows. Ted Lasso and The Queen's Gambit were just some of the standouts. Yet, where 2020 truly shined was in the ongoing and established shows that dropped new seasons. We had the final seasons of Dark, Schitt's Creek, and BoJack Horseman. We got the best season of The Mandalorian, one of the best of Better Call Saul, a season of The Boys, The Crown, and so much more. 2020 provided the escape we desperately needed from the chaos the world endured, while 2021 didn't quite measure up. Many shows actually skipped over 2021, and there's a good reason behind that move. Movies had a tough run in 2020 since most of their revenue comes from the box office. With theaters shutting down, studios delayed most films until things got back to normal. Completed films were left on standby until 2021, and production delays pushed movies to subsequent years, making 2020 the sacrificial year for film. TV shows don't rely on theater. They thrive on TVs at home, and people were tuning in more than ever due to the pandemic. Shows that were ready for 2020 stuck to their original release schedule. Networks and streaming services just had to be cautious about how they rolled out their existing content to stay afloat until production picked up again. What we ended up with was 2021 becoming the year where most pre-COVID produced shows hit screens a year earlier, in 2020, while many shows with postponed productions missed out on 2021. Although COVID affected TV much worse over those three years because live events were disrupted, when strictly comparing TV shows to films, then 2020's film year was much worse than 2021's TV show year. For our next contender for the worst year of TV, we didn't have to go too far back to the year 2001. That was the year that really kicked off the reality TV craze. Reality TV actually dates back to the 40s, which had various game shows and prank shows. Although the genre evolved through each passing decade, it was nothing like what we have today, where each streaming service floods its libraries with reality TV content because of how cheap it is to produce. This surge in reality TV played a significant role in the shift from what some might call the peak TV era to the trough TV era. Era. More on this in a bit. The affordability of making reality TV is just one side of the coin because plenty of people eat it up. Three shows deserve credit for truly propelling reality TV into the mainstream. Who Wants to Be a Millionaire dominated the TV scene in the year 2000, snagging the top three spots for its different airings during the week. It not only gave the game show subgenre a resurgence, but also got audiences hooked on watching regular people compete for a ton of money. This mentality spilled over into the success of the next two shows we're highlighting, The Idol franchise and Survive. The Idol craze started in 2001 with Pop Idol in Britain, but hit its stride with American Idol the following year. American Idol ruled US television for the entire decade, spawning numerous reality competition shows. However, it was Survivor's triumph in 2001, topping the charts that wielded the most significant influence. 
Survivor not only involved contestants competing for a hefty sum like other shows, but also infused the drama of real people into the mix. Much like Big Brother, Survivor granted contestants the power to vote out other contestants. It was this fusion of drama and reality that transformed the genre into the juggernaut we see today. Reality TV isn't inherently bad. In fact, some shows are genuinely entertaining. The ability to create these kinds of shows inexpensively, appealing to a specific audience, should ideally allow for more investment in quality programming. But alas, that's not how the industry operates. Studios and networks are driven by greed. The reality TV frenzy grabbed every studio exec's attention, proving that hit shows could be churned out for cheap. Many channels jumped on this bandwagon during the decade. Remember when the History Channel was actually about history? Or when TLC, the learning channel, wasn't crammed with reality? shows. Everyone cashed in on the craze and since the streaming wars, it's made a resurgence. Reality shows are also less affected by writer strikes, so they've gained a boost during those strikes this century. But the issue is that nowadays, reality shows barely resemble reality and have become quite deceptive in their editing, for storylines, or often staging. And all these issues can be traced back to 2001, the year reality TV took over. For the next worst year, let's journey way back to 1975. Now, this wasn't necessarily a terrible year of TV, but for TV. Let me hit you with a bit of history first. Back in the 1950s, the film industry started feeling the heat from a new threat, television. Each passing year, having a TV set at home became more the norm. People found fewer reasons to hit up theaters when they had entertainment at home for free. And alongside this TV takeover, Hollywood's studio system was crumbling. From the mid 50s to 60s, movie ticket sales plummeted. Studios tried various tactics to keep theaters enticing, like releasing more color films since TVs were still black and white, and even screening more controversial films, given TV's stricter content regulations. But ticket sales kept dropping. To stay afloat, studios had to diversify, producing TV shows and licensing out their films for TV broadcast. But in a bid to shake things up, studios gave some control to a fresh wave of filmmakers in the late 60s. Instead of studio-driven films, these new filmmakers were given near total creative control, birthing the era known as New Hollywood. This era had films delving into grittier, darker human themes which somewhat aided ticket sales in the early 70s. But then came along one filmmaker who really put TV in its place as the lesser form of entertainment. Steven Spielberg. In 1975, Spielberg released Jaws, a movie that took the world by storm and birthed the concept of the summer blockbuster. Soon after, we got Star Wars and Close Encounters that helped usher in the decade of blockbusters, another name for the 80s. Studios engineered blockbusters to pack theaters all throughout the year, and with advancements in theater sound systems using THX, the cinema experience became an absolute must. Watching these flicks at home just couldn't compete. As a result, movie ticket sales climbed, even though they were pricier than during the decline. But TV wasn't really competing with films. In fact, it was even used to help promote these blockbuster films. But 1975 still stands out as a rough year for TV because what could have been? In the 60s, TV began to gain momentum with studios investing heavily in it. However, this sudden newfound form in film sidelined TV investment, keeping it in the shadows as a lesser medium for quite some time. It wasn't until the 2000s that people began taking TV seriously. These days, it's very common to see top actors starring in TV shows. And the debate over which is the superior form of media is a hot topic, but back in the 80s and 90s, TV was easily viewed as a lesser art form. It really makes you wonder what the state of film and TV could have been if Hollywood never found their footing back in 1975. Let's quickly go through our next worst year because it's a bit of a repeat from the worst film year, 2008. The Writers Guild of America went on strike on November 5th, 2007, lasting a whopping 100 days until it wrapped up on February 12th the following year. The WGA wanted increased DVD residuals, residuals from new forms of media and jurisdiction over reality TV. Around 12,000 film and TV screenwriters joined the strike, and the industry took a huge hit, bleeding an estimated 1.5 to 2.1 billion due to all the paused production. But TV was affected much worse than film. A bunch of shows faced delays, got their seasons shortened, or were straight up cancelled. Many people attribute the strike to the downfall of Heroes, whose second season got cut short. Although, let's be real, even the episodes written before the strike weren't anywhere close to the quality of season 1. Pushing Daisies maybe got screwed the most, a hit early on, only to return after the strike to a much smaller audience after a shortened season. However, the strike did gift us some great Conan O'Brien moments when he came back on air unscripted after all talk shows shut down. Plus, it saved Jesse from being killed off very early in Breaking Bad. Overall, the strike had a negative impact on what shows were being produced during that time, but in the grand scheme, it was really good for those involved in the industry. We're always supportive with these kinds of strikes, including the 2023 Writers and Actors Strike, which leads us nicely to our final worst year of TV, 2024. 
If 2023 is any indication, then 2024 or whatever year you're watching this in might just earn a top spot as one of the worst years for TV. Sure, the backlog of delays from the lengthy writers and actors strike in 2023 plays a part, but there's much more to it. We've got some promising shows returning like House of the Dragon, Arcane, and Andor, and new shows with potential like The Fallout Show, The Penguin, and Three Body Problem. But let's face it, the current TV landscape and where it's heading isn't looking so great. The golden age of TV and the streaming wars is behind us. Early on in the streaming wars, each service churned out top-notch original content. Spread across multiple platforms, many of us had more than one subscription as they were more affordable back then or we shared them instead. But reality hit studios hard after years of losses except for Netflix. Netflix was the early adopter with price hikes and password sharing restrictions and caught a lot of flack for it, but soon enough, all services followed suit. This is all fair, I guess, but it's when their content strategy shifts that it becomes worse for TV. Remember that idea we tossed around last year how we, the consumer, lost the streaming wars? These services are based on the subscription model, so their two main goals are snagging new subscribers and subscriber retention. And making top tier original content to achieve this is too expensive. So instead, they've opted for churning out cheaper shows, throwing everything at the wall, axing what doesn't stick, and relying heavily on reality TV as their go-to. The other tactic we've seen is going the safer route by doubling down on existing IPs. Disney has squeezed Star Wars and the MCU dry. Then there are those half-hearted revivals like Paramount Plus's Frasier and Netflix's That 90s Show, or Netflix's live-action anime remakes. Sure, they're successful, but it's a bummer not seeing those resources be put into something original. That's the state of TV now, zero risk. Every year we're bombarded with more content, but there are fewer and fewer gems. We hope we're wrong though. Maybe some under the radar new shows will surprise us this year. Often the most anticipated shows are based on existing IPs or come from renowned creators. But sometimes a hidden gem like The Bear sneaks in, grabbing our attention out of nowhere. So fingers crossed for more surprises like that this year. And that wraps up what we think are the worst years in TV history. Thanks for watching. What do you think? Do you agree with our picks or are there other years worth mentioning? Drop your thoughts in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like and subscribe, check out our Patreon for perks, and until next time, have a good one.